What are you doing? Teresa, before we get into all the uh, into the, the nitty gritty of the mask, can you sort of tell us a little bit about who you are and your background? Oh, OK. Yeah. I'm my ch- I'm my uh, my background is medical writing and I was um, in the news media for. Uh, the early part of my career and then moved on into uh, medical writing. Uh, because I became interested because a family member had issues. And so anyway, I started working clinically in sleep medicine as a polysomnographic technologist. And that is a fancy word for uh, sleep tech. So I watched you sleep, basically. And, and what, what is exactly your role with the sleepapnea.org and the American Sleep Apnea Association? I do education for our staff and for the public at large, and I work with people in our support groups to uh, help them get over issues they may be having with treatment. Are you yourself a patient? I am a patient, and I am the wife of a patient. (laughs) Are you also a board member of the American Sleep Apnea? Yes, and I am a board member of the <laughs> American Sleep Apnea Association. I should have uh, said that, I guess. That's okay. You should lead, you should lead with that. You're, you're our community leader and board member of the American Sleep Apnea okay. Association. Uh, okay. More importantly, you are, why are you an expert and able to explain to us about MassFit uh, to our community? Well, because as a polysomnographic technician, I measured many people to put the mask on them uh, during the study because we would do a first part of the study where they would have respiratory events. And then the second part, we had enough data to be able to prove to insurance companies that this person actually needed one. So then we would do a test, a trial of CPAP with them or PAP, positive airway pressure. So the mask had to be fitted prior to this when the patient was still awake. And there is a number of considerations when looking at a person's face or measuring a person's face for the many, 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 many different brands and styles of masks that are out there. So if you don't mind, um, let, let's sort of go through some of the individual ones. Like uh, some people have small noses. Some people might, like myself, have a recessed chin. Uh, some people have problems with air around their eyes. Uh, what are the type of different little tricks that you're trying to do? Okay. Well, for instance, it would be important for a person and actually when they were getting ready for their sleeping in the sleep lab, they would still have their dentures in because they didn't want to be in front of somebody without their dentures, I guess. So that's an important point. However, it is, is, has to be careful later on because there, there were no teeth in when the person was sleeping. There were no dentures. So this actually sucked the the cheeks and the lips down in so now the mask was not fitting all of a sudden when they got home and got their prescribed mask so that's something to really be careful for if you know that you're going to be fitted for a CPAP mask you should take your dentures out if that's the way you usually sleep so I'll use that as a segue to to, to flip to our other uh, panelists we have Jill Friedman the chief strategist officer for sleepapnea.org and Will Hedepole, our uh, board chair emeritus, uh, who's been with me in this journey for the last seven years in, in converting us sleepapnea.org and the American Sleep Apnea Association over to a patient-led, uh, innovative patient group uh, in the healthcare world. So, Jills, if you want to go, introduce yourself. Sure. So, I joined uh, your journey a couple of years ago, first as a... Uh, as an artist and designer, making portraits of patients with sleep apnea and helping you redesign the website. And uh, I then like, started to use my prior work of, for the last 20-some years 
building online communities for mostly people with cancer and serious diseases. And we are now going to work to build up the communities that uh, you started quite a few years ago. And Will. Hi, Will Hedepal. Um, I'm on the board of ASAA, and uh, I actually am a uh, long-term patient. Um, I think 25 years I've been managing this condition, um, and it, it just kind of started out uh, as a problem, uh, and then I've various, have various different solutions over the years. And thing, I, one of the points I want to make is things do change. Um, so um, on the mask question, uh, I used to have a nasal prong, and now I have a full face mask because the pressure has gone up. But uh, this is this is a, an area that's really important to me. My son uh, has sleep apnea, and, and several of my siblings and my nephew have sleep apnea. So it is a thing that runs in the family, and uh, so I've spent a lot of time trying to um, help them sort things out and, and also help others. Great, Teresa. Do you want to continue with the next question? What is the best method of determining a, a well-fitting pap mass size? Yes. When, when a person is often left to their own devices, uh, and I like to talk to, about this uh, after a person has experienced CPAP and experienced the mass, sometimes they are not pleased with the fit. So, if they had to look in a mirror and determine, you know, what is their facial symmetry? What is, you know, do they have a wide nose? Do they have a, a recessed chin? You know, some of, the, uh, you know, some of these types of things. Um, and you would be able to sometimes be able to look at masks online and they will show a 360 uh, degree view so that you can kind of look at the shape of that particular mask brand and see if it's going to kind of match up with what you look like. And that's important because you can go through several, several masks till you get the sweet spot mask for you. It's also a good idea to have a mask that is an extra and have one on the side in case something happens that you're pet or something, you know, chew up your mask. There you go. You have an extra. So th this, this sort of leads me to the next question. And, is, you know, a lot of our patients and people often ask in our community always says, you know, I wake up with red marks on my face or the bridge of my nose. Uh, and even the skin is, is, is swelled or irritated. What are some of the things that you or Will can do to uh, some of the tricks of the trade that you guys have learned over your years of uh, working with patients and yourselves? Um, with your mask? Well, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I, I have always done mask fitting by myself, um, and it's been uh, a journey. And one of the things I have uh, heard from a lot of our uh, members uh, is you, you don't want to give up. Um, the computer is the hardware. I mean, the, the CPAP is the hardware, and the, and the mask is the software. And if you don't have good software on your computer, it's not going to work there that well. Same thing with a mask. And so I think one methodology is to have, just keep trying different masks. Uh, it's a little bit expensive to do that, but uh, if you find one that fits, it's like, oh my God, this is so great. I had no idea that it would work this well. The other strategy that I personally have used is to have different masks for different situations. Uh, nasal prong masks for um, uh, places where maybe I, I have to carry something uh, in my suitcase and I don't want to have the full face mask if I can tolerate that or if the full face mask if I'm at home uh, and I want to get really, really uh, good sleep. Sometimes it's just not practical to bring something that's big. And I definitely uh, support the idea of having multiple masks because in the middle of the night you might step on it um, and you don't want to be someplace where all of a sudden your, your CPAP is broken. Yeah, it's, it's one of the tricks of the trade. If I know I'm going traveling, I'll bring, always bring a backup mask. I'll bring a, you know, a roll of tape or something if there's a, a plug in my, in my silicone hose. Uh, you know, they tell you if you're going travel, bring an, ex, an extension cord or, or, or a, a multiple converter battery thing. Um, 
So it looks like we have a, a poll we want to send out to everyone. So if everyone could look on their screen, uh, first question is, is, I've changed my behavior since the start of this pandemic. Uh, as a result of using your CPAP, have you changed your behavior um, as, a start of, as a result of this pandemic? Have, have you changed your social distancing or total isolation? Have you interrupted your CPAP use? Have you stockpiled food? Are you stockpiling your CPAP supplies? We have our CPAP assistance program. You know, we have a, we have a large inventory of factory sealed clean CPAP masks right now. Uh, for those patients that are worried about not being able to get the inventory, know that we have four per household per family per year uh, that we have might not be your mask, but we do have full face masks for you. Uh, God forbid you, uh, you're, 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 you're cutting the bind or you don't have much money. And, and we know, we know times are going to be really hard for everyone right now. So. Um, for a $25 program donation fee, which is about a, uh, a tenth of what these, mach- these masks and these machines cost online, we, uh, we have this program. It's at sleepapnea.org. So uh, please visit our site there. And, uh, and um, if, 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 if you need a mask, uh, know that in this time of crisis that we still have them here for you uh, until one of these states decides to come and gobble them up. <laughs> so I just wanted one, one, one more uh, comment uh, that occurred to me is, um, when you do travel and you have maybe multiple parts, just like in a computer center where you don't have all your computers in one place in case a fire comes through, uh, the same thing should apply when you travel. So I keep my spare parts or, or key things separate from my main device. Uh, and that way, I, you know, and it happened to me once I was in India and I, I sat down my whole, my whole thing and my mask and everything was gone and I had to run around. Uh, for three days trying to find all the parts. So should we, be, should we try another question here? Yeah, I was just going to ask Jill's. Not, not that uh, I know Jill's doesn't wear a CPAP mask, but he's been using an oral appliance, you know, for, sort of more for the, for the traveling sort of world, if uh, he's still having success with that, uh, and as that might be a good option for some of our patients during this kind of crisis. You got to unmute yourself there. Jill's. Yes. So the, the oral appliance was really great at the beginning, but I then noticed that it was changing my mouth. Yeah. And it changed my mouth enough that uh, I had a couple of issues with a couple of teeth. Right. And then I stopped using it. That was, I mean, it's really unexpected and unfortunate because while I was using it, I slept really well with it. And this specific appliance had something special in front of the appliance. It had a silicone, um, like uh, a jacket in front of it made from silicone that completely blocked the entry of air from my mouth that forced me to breathe from the nose. Right. And the nose breathing made the entire difference. And the, the, the reason I wanted to bring up that question is because with a lot of our masks, People have leaking issues. It could be because of the mask seal or the fact that the nose is plugged up and they're leaking out their, their, their mouth or they're just mouth breathers and it's leaking out their nose so that when you use oral appliances, they're great in that they force us to breathe with our nose, but it can't be at the detriment of our dentures or our, our teeth or our TMJ or anything else that might be going on. Um, so you got to figure out what works for you, especially in a crisis like right now. So, you know, even something as simple as elevating your head, bu- headboard for people with reflux is a really good trick of the trade right now. So you know? it's important to note that the oral appliance that was made for me was made like re- like an, an emergency was done too fast. He just wanted to show me how it worked. Right. And I am sure that if he does it for regular people, It's going to take four or five times longer, and they're going to fit a lot better. What was really interesting is that he gave me two different appliances. One that is just like standing on its own, like a a classical oral appliance. Over the counter? That that replaces a mask for a CPAP machine, where the part of the oral appliance is attached to uh, directly to your CPAP machine. And I, unfortunately, I never tried this. I really should one day. Uh, you might, you might want to try it now, especially if you're not using the oral appliance, because it's, 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 it's actually the manufacturers, the tap pass 
uh, the tap the pat tap pat mask where it's an oral appliance but it's also still connected to your the nasal part is still connected to your CPAP machine so it's actually a combo hybrid uh which I've always thought has some great potential for if if there were some more uh, have, innovation have you, ever, have you ever tried one of those yes I have did it work for you It worked for me, but the problem is because I'm at such a high pressure that the, it's too high a pressure for just nasal pressure alone. So that's why I need a full face mask. Sure. There's also something else called combinational therapy where you, you do a combination of the CPAP and the oral appliance. Because the key thing is you want to keep the airflow going through your nose. But if you're using the nasal prong, for example, or nasal mask, And your mouth opens up and the air blows through and dries your mouth out and it's very uncomfortable. But if you have a, a mild uh, advanced mat, uh, uh, oral appliance, you can, you can use that in conjunction with that. And actually for me, for five or six, seven years, it worked really, really well. Um, it, I did have the same problem though. It moved my teeth around and eventually I, I would be biting my tongue because my My teeth, my jaw was pulled forward a little bit, even when I wasn't wearing it. Uh, so I ended up, that's why I ended up having to go to a full face mask because my mouth opens up and that's the worst thing that can happen when you have a mask. Uh, and, but if you have a full face mask, then it doesn't matter because it's all pressurized. Right. Teresa, do you want to add something to this? Because I think uh, from your experience in the lab, I think it'd be really helpful. Well, uh, first I wanted to ask uh, Gilles, did you, Uh, go to a sleep study. Did you have that done or not? Not really. Okay. Well, then this is my suggestion for you as you were discussing your problems there with uh, the oral clients and such. And if you would want to try, say, an auto CPAP, auto PAP device, you could go online with a physician and he is going to be able to look at you, talk to you, ask you some questions and do telemedicine so that you can get a prescription for an auto PAP device, which is going to set, they're going to set a range for you and it's going to be a comfortable range between what they think, you know, where they think you would fall. Describe, if, since you described your issues, that would help you in the meantime until you could get a sleep study. And it would cover you as far as, uh, you know, depleting those apneas and uh, diminishing possibly your oxygen level. Uh, you could be having problems there. Can you describe what's the difference between an autopap and a CPAP machine? Yes. A CPAP is a continuous a bolus of pressure that goes to the back of the throat and sort of keeps it open. The skin and the tissue in the back of the throat is very flexible And that pressure can push it so that it takes any kind of obstruction out of the way or snoring or that sort of thing. So um, I forgot the second part of your question. It's, it's okay, Teresa. It, 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 you made me really think of a couple of good questions as, as, okay. an add -on, as an add on to what you're asking, Jills. In light of this crisis, you know, a lot of people are not going to be able to go to sleep labs anymore. Uh, and, and, and since the world is being reversed and we're going to a telehealth mode, are the sleep doctors or the, or the general physicians, are they going to write uh, prescriptions for CPAP machines just based off of telehealth? Or are they still going to require home sleep study tests? How is that all going to work now? I think it's it's being invented as we speak. Uh, more and more physicians are taking uh, of a sleep practice are taking on telemedicine. Uh, there's a number that have done it before, but now they're really ramping it up because people can't go. They are also disposable home sleep tests. If that if that could be mailed to a person, uh, and then the physician would get that information quickly. He could see the person on his computer, his or her computer, and prescribe uh, a specific constant pressure CPAP versus an auto PAP. Right. 
So one of the things I could see is is whether the the need for the the in home testing is even necessary at this point. But even just the uh, you know, it's it's almost the over the counter method, and and this is one disease and one intervention, particularly for for sleep apnea patients that is it's actually harder to get than a gun or or, or narcotics at this point. It would be interesting to see in the middle of this crisis if not only the the sleep professional field model is turned upside down, which it looks like it's happening, uh, but that we have telehealth is now primary and actually how we get these interventions um, from our, our clinicians or from our providers, whether it's through the ENT and the allergist, through the dentist, uh, through the, the, the pulmonologist, uh, the asthma and the allergies or the cardiovascular doctors just how this all is going to work now from a remote basis, because, you know, it's, it appears that we're not going back to the way things are. So, you know, I, I'd like sort of like to leave that maybe as the cliffhanger for our next topic. Uh, but I think these are the conversations we start need to start having with the different key stakeholders in the field, uh, because I, I know our patients have a lot of questions. So I want to thank Jill's uh, Freeman, uh, Will Hedepole, and of course, Teresa Schumard uh, for participating today on a uh, uh, afternoon with the sleepapnea.org uh, sleepapnea.org as we try to find out and learn about um, our CPAPs, our mask, our, our disease in the midst of this COVID crisis. Hope all, everyone is safe and well and take care of yourself and put your mask on first before helping others around you. I'd like to give Will uh, a call to action. Anything you want to sort of leave our audience with? Well, I, yeah, one thing, the last thing I was thinking is, um, since this is all about masks, uh, the ASAA does provide uh, a service, um, and we have masks in stock um, uh, for a small uh, donation fee. You can, you can send your prescription in, uh, ask for a mask, and we'll send it to you. And, and uh, back on what I was saying, it, sometimes you just don't know if it's going to fit or not, and you have to try a number of things. So I would encourage you to do that if, if it's uh, applicable to your situation. I, I got to unmute myself. I said, now's a great time to, to stock up on supplies if, if you don't have it. Uh, and ne necessary supplies, not hoarding supplies, not fear mongering supplies. Our, our community should know that we have CPAP masks in inventory uh, and they're, they're, you know, it might not be your mask, but there always will be a mask available. The online retailers have them as well. Uh, that will not go in short supply. There is a run on CPAP machines. That's a different story. So. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, was I heard there or was I muted? I heard you. Okay. Jills, you want to sort of uh, give a, a call to action and, last, and a wrap up as far as from a, the comorbid uh, cancer, you know, participatory medicine, MedEx, all these different backgrounds and experience in communities in the midst of this crisis and for our sleep, ap uh, sleep apnea patients? Well, the entire world is held in their home right now, full of worries and full of concerns. And... I hope that we're going to be able to help a large number of people to tell us what are their experience right now. It's pretty obvious that everybody, uh, sleep is an important part of the life of everybody. So all the comorbidities that are usually associated with sleep apnea are even more to the fore right now. And I hope we're going to be able in the near future to help people tell their story. Mute. Teresa, is there something you want to uh, uh, um, send us away with as far as uh, final thoughts in, in this crazy world we're living in? I do. Everybody knows that I am a nap pusher, and there's nothing wrong with taking a little nap in the afternoon. If you're just, I mean, we're inside. Boost that immune system. Give yourself a little extra uh time out and get those naps and and so if you sleep a little bit extra in the morning don't worry about it don't say oh well, i need to keep my schedule that is important you want to keep your circadian rhythm at you know optimal levels but 
right now, a little extra sleep is not going to hurt anybody. We could use the relaxation. We could help. It could help to calm nerves. It it's all around. It's it's advisable. Thank you, everybody, so much. Uh, we'll be back uh, same time, same place uh, later this week. Check us out at sleepapnea.org on our Facebook page, on uh, LinkedIn professional groups, on Instagram, on our forum. Uh, we're here for you. We feel for you. Uh, and we will be our, do our best to get back to you with some timely, up-to-date information as best we can. Thank you and be safe. Mm-hmm.